a developer since 2001. I uh, started using mostly the, the Java Spring stack. And then uh, at some point I discovered Grails. Uh, I think it was 2008 or something like that. And uh, since then I've been heavily using it. And um, in 2015 I joined OCI on the uh, Groovy and Grails team and now Micronaut. So, yeah. Um, uh, you know, OCI um, is um, supporting not only Groovy, but also Grace, Micronaut. So, um, if you have any, any project or anything you think uh, OCI can help you, uh, don't hesitate to talk to us because um, we're happy to. And uh, as a personal note, I, I became a father last year, so uh, fun times ahead. Um, so, uh, how many of you is using uh, Grails 3? Okay, and GORM 6? Not so many. Cool. Makes sense, that's why you're, you're here, right? So, um, I've uh, picked the, probably the, the six more uh, relevant uh, features of uh, GORM 6.0 and 6.1, and uh, I'll, I'll show them to you with uh, demos eventually. So uh, the first one is uh, GORM uh, without Grails and, or even Spring Boot or even Micronaut, so standalone. This is possible since uh, the latest versions. Um, this would be the whole, or pretty much almost the whole build of Gradle you need. So there's a bunch of dependencies, um, but that's all. So, well, Groovy, of course, if you want to use Groovy as a language, then uh, this is the GORM for Hibernate. You could use a GORM for MongoDB or whatever. If you're using uh, Beam Validation API, uh, you need an implementation in the class path. Uh, so that's um, this uh, Hibernate validation de dependency here. Uh, the rest of that is essentially uh, um, JDBC pool, uh, login stuff, uh, and Spock for testing if you, if you use it. So I've got here an application to show what I'm talking about. Why is blinking? Right, so uh, this is the, uh, the build.gradle file, the whole of it. Uh, it's the only thing you need. And then um, I have only three classes. So this is a, the main class. The difference with uh, using this uh, in any um, let's say framework like Rails or Spring Boot or whatever, uh, you need to annotate your entities with add entity because, um, well, this is actually different uh, from Rails because in Micronaut it's, it's the same thing. The reason is that in Rails, uh, Rails applies an HT transformation automatically for all the classes in Rails subdomain because there's a conventional folder. But uh, in a standalone application, there's not. And uh, I've got a GORM data service, which I'll explain later, and uh, a main class. Uh, you need a bit of configuration, right? So the, uh, the way you define the data source in, uh, in a Grace application, um, like data source URL, uh, or the create job for, uh, for the schema, uh, in a standalone application, you basically pa pass a map uh, of configuration to the Hibernate data store. This is the, uh, the requirement to initialize GORM, that's all. And it's very much what we do in unit testing, we will see later. And then uh, you can use any, any GORM method. Uh, so this test here, we're creating a bunch of uh, clubs, and then uh, we're printing them. So if I were to run this, 
should print the output. I'm very fast, as you can see. Uh, I changed the um, login to basically reduce uh, where is it? the, the load back um, to be a, a warn level. But if I put this into info, then we'll see all the Hibernate shit logging happening. So this is actually Hibernate initialization, GORM, everything. So it works. Very easy, right? So I've, I've mentioned a data service. How many of you know what a data service is? Raise your hands. Only one person. Cool. Uh, this was introduced in 6.1, I believe. Uh, and it's a really cool feature. I think uh, you'll like it. So the idea of a data service, data services are auto-generated persistence logic. You know, it's like that. It's auto-generated. Uh, from where? From interfaces or raster classes. So I have here uh, an interface called book service. The way we tell GORM which domain class this service applies to is with the add service annotation. And we specify the domain class this um, uh, GORM data service applies to. And then we have methods in an interface. So you can see there's no implementation. I'll tell you how that works later. So advantages of this uh, approach. Uh, first of all, is type safe. Because uh, all the signatures of your uh, interfaces and Astra classes are statically compiled. So if you make mistakes or something like that, uh, it'll throw a compilation error. Um, they can be easily tested because they are interfaces. So you, in a unit test, for instance, you could, you could mock it. And you could say, uh, for the getBook method, I want to return a hard-coded book with uh, whatever value uh, just for the sake of my unit testing. Performance, uh, there's no random proxies. So everything happens at compile time. And uh, transaction management. Um, so all the, all the transactional logic is applied uh, smartly. So for instance, read operations are given read-only transactions. And write operations are given uh, a normal transaction. Uh, if I go back for a minute to the to the demo I did uh, here, where is this guy here, right? So this works. This is a these are calls to a data, the data service I told you, right? This is the implementation. Uh, it's, an interf it's a data service for the domain class club. Uh, and it's got a few methods. I'm actually just using a couple of them, right? Um, the, so the, these calls here in the main methods are working because the save method, the implementation that GORM is giving to you, is wrapped in a transaction. If I were going to use directly something like new club, um, blah, 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 whatever dot save, this wouldn't work because there, there's no transactional boundary here. So we'll have to do uh, club with transaction, da, 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 closure. And then uh, do my my stuff here inside of the transaction. Okay, this is a difference. In Rails, for instance, uh, your controllers are wrapped in transactions and services and, and so on, so you don't have to do this. But uh, outside of Rails, like in Micronaut, for instance, or in a standalone application, you you do need to do this, unless you use a data service, which is the recommended approach. So uh, you can also have an Astra class, and this is useful for when, let's say, you've got a couple of basic operations, 
uh, like uh, find, book, find book by primary key, you know? I can have Gorm implement that uh, for me. Uh, but there's the, the, there are moments when you want to implement a custom operation. Uh, so you define the methods that you want Gorm to implement for you as abstract, and then you implement your own. As simple as that. Um, in order to use pagination, uh, you declare your method in the interface with a, an option, with a, a parameter of type map, and then uh, Gorm will understand that you will pass the typical offset, max, sort, and other uh, map properties for pagination. So you will be thinking how this works, how it's possible, what is Gorm doing to understand how does it need to, to implement the operations. And the idea is that there is a convention. This is uh, described on the, on the documentation, and there is a convention. So basically, uh, there is a prefix for common operations, like for instance, find, or count, or save, or update, right? And then, after that, it'll expect a domain class name, or a property name, or things like that. So based on the method name, GORM will uh, check the operation it needs to implement. So in this case, it's get the prefix. So it knows uh, it's a read operation, uh, and it's actually a book. But uh, the, the, there's, an, there's a stronger hint for, uh, for GORM to understand it needs to return a book, and it needs the return type. We're clearly telling Gorm we, we want the book, right? Uh, in this example here, find is the prefix, so it's a read operation. And then uh, the return type tells Gorm we, this is a, you know, as a um, more than one result possible. So because this is a, this is a query over a domain class book, this title argument will be statically compiled. So there has to be a property named title in your domain class, otherwise uh, they'll get a compilation error, right? So this is great because you don't make mistakes. Uh, there could be more complex examples, right? So find by, uh, hint for GORM to, to understand that the it needs to do something like dynamic finder-like queries. And I'm, I'm quoting dynamic finder, uh, finder because they're not, dynamic. They're, they're not dynamic. They are statically compiled, right? But uh, it's, um, the signature will be similar. Uh, you can also define work queries with the add where annotation, and you pass a closure with the properties. Once again, if you make a typo, here on the on title, for instance, you'll get a compilation error, right? And then uh, again, this is checked, so the the uh, parameter name has to match the comparison values you provide here. It's really small, smart. You can do joins with the add join annotation when you want to. Um, Let's say a book has authors, and I want a book with authors, then uh, you make the join. If this is not enough, you can always specify an HQL SQL query or a JPA QL query as well. Um, and again, this is statically compiled again. So, for instance, if you make a, a typo here in the title property, you will get a compilation error. You can do projections. So let's say you have a book and the book has a release date. I may want to have not a query of books, but a projection of a property of a book, if you know what I mean. Uh, so that's what we do here. Or I may want to do a, proje a projection over all the uh, release dates of all the, bo the books filtered by publisher. So this, this is quite powerful. 
So, uh, unit testing. Uh, this is all you need to, um, to unit test the GORM. And uh, I would say uh, this is not really unit testing because we are effectively bootstrapping GORM here, right? So, uh, if you see this line, this is the line I had in my main application before, right? But uh, it's so fast that you can, uh, you can use it in a unit test. There's no reason for you to, to not do it. Uh, this is different from previous versions of, of GORM where you had, uh, uh, you know, for unit tests, you will have uh, like an in-memory implementation. Uh, not all the operations were supported, so there was limited support for unit testing. Uh, but with GORM 6, uh, not anymore. So uh, this is really great. This is all you need to, to unit test um, um, with GORM. There's one thing to be aware of, and is again the transaction management, right? There's no transaction by default, so there's uh, two things you can do. Uh, most of the times you will want to use the add rollback annotation. So add rollback annotation wraps the method in the transaction that will get rollback at the end of the, once the, the method has finished. Uh, but you can use also add transactional or you can control yourself the transaction boundaries with uh, like a club dot with transaction or something like that. Um, so um, there's, there's more things you could do here. Like for instance, you can uh, declare additional uh, domain classes. You can inline them here. So I could say uh class player uh, we annotate them with entity and we could say string names that it belongs to right something like this so this is really handy if you want to test uh, something specifically, uh, it'll work. You can inline uh, domain classes here. Um, what else? Multiple data sources. So uh, it is possible in GORM to use not only the, the default data source, uh, we can uh, we can configure additional data sources, and the data source is essentially you could point to a different database, to a different schema over the same database. So you'll you're able to provide uh, the full uh, you know data source uh, coordinates, right? So uh, in this case, I'm using two H2 data uh, databases, but uh, it's not limited to that. So you can have anything you want. Uh, the only limitation about this is relationships. So if you think about uh, a domain class and the graph of relationships around it, they have to be um, on the same data source, right? You, you can't have um, any relationship in domain classes which belong to different data sources. Uh, so you could do this, you could, use, you could use this in different ways. You could say, for instance, uh, I want a domain class to use only one data source or all the data sources available, like what we do here. So in the mapping closure, there is a um, configuration, let's say configuration property called data source. And you, you there specify either all or the ones you want, or you could say connection source dot default, right, to point to, point to the default data source definition. Uh, for me, this would be the default one, and this would be an additional one uh, called Premier. And then um, there is a data source namespace. So when you say domain class or domain object and then a, da a data source name, 
the operation will be run on that particular data source. Uh, if you don't specify anything, like uh, as usual, uh, it will be run on the default data source. So in this case, I've got a, a club domain class uh, mapped to all the data sources available. Uh, I also have, um, as I told you, this is the, the default data source, and then I've got uh, another one defined. And then uh, when creating uh, domain classes, uh, I'm saving two of them in the default data source and two of them in the premier data source because they belong to different leads. So um, I think we can run this guy here. And uh, we can go to, this is a uh, localhost uh, 8080 DB console. This is running already. So if I go to the La Liga connection, that's the club table, and it's got the two ones that I, in uh, inserted on, on that data source. If, uh, however, I go to the other data source, I've got the other two, right? Very simple. The other thing is multi-tenancy. Uh, the idea of multi-tenancy is when you have an application where you can have different tenants. Let's say you have a, a, a software as a service business, uh, you've got different applications, so let's say uh, it's actually a club management application following the same samples we are, we're doing. And then you sell this to, to Premier League and you sell this to, to La Liga in Spain. Um, so you don't want you know, the clubs table to be shared across them, so it'll be, it won't be a, a great idea. So uh, potentially you'll have like different subdomains. So you'll have like uh, um, laliga.football.com uh, or soccer.com and uh, premierleague.football.com. Uh, there's three ways you can partition your data. And they are listed in the order of more isolated to less isolated. Uh, obviously, the, the best, um, let's say, the more isolation mode will be to have different databases. They are physically sep uh, separated, right? There's, there's no chance to have... This, this, this is the, let's say, the best for your customers, but it's probably the less convenient for you because you need to be able to configure those databases, of course. So you'll have to have a DVA or, or you know, procedures to be able to, um, to configure these da databases. Uh, so there is a different database, different data source uh, for each of the tenants. You can have a single database with different schemas, right? So now they'll live on the same database instance, but they have different schemas. This is also an option. Um, again, you need uh, someone to provide, um, you know, the ability to 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 create these schemas uh, for you, like a DBA or or someone. And uh, the last one is a discriminator, and they live on, they live together. They all live together. You have a single table, uh, and uh, 
each of the classes has a, have a, an additional tenant ID um, key, which uh, GORM will transparently um, use in queries, depending on the tenant. This one doesn't require any setup other than, well, not even declaring the, the, the property because Corn will do it. Uh, but it's obviously, you have to be very careful so that uh, there's no place where you're allowing, you know, to make a query of a different tenant or something like that. There's uh, three AST transformations you can use in your code to deal with a uh, multi-tenant uh, application. The add current tenant will wrap all GORM operations to the class or method where, it, where, it, where that is applied so that they resolve to the current tenant. And there's different ways to resolve a tenant. I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, the add tenant annotation can be used to resolve to a particular tenant if you want. And um, it's also possible to run without a tenant, so to not filter by tenant ID. Uh, this is useful, for instance, in your software as a service application. You may want to have a, uh, an admin panel for yourself, and you may want to know how many clubs in, in total do I have of all the tenants, right? So you'll do that. So this is one example. Uh, you apply a current tenant by default to all the operations on this service, but for instance, for the, the count players, you want to run without a tenant. And for this um, particular one, you want to run it on a particular tenant, if you want. So, uh, how are tenants resolved? Uh, you have to specify a tenant resolver class. And there's an interface called tenant resolver. Uh, and um, it defines a single method called resolve tenant with no parameters. And then you have to return a, a serializable um, object, like string or long or whatever, right? There's several built-in tenant resolvers. So there is a tenant resolver which resolves tenants from uh, subdomains, right? So if you have the example I, I told you, uh, laliga.football.com uh, and then you have um, premierleague.football.com they are both mapping to the same server based on the subdomain uh, uh, Grails in this case will determine which tenant is going to be selected right? Uh, but uh, there are other built-in tenant resolvers like for instance there is a system property tenant resolver so if you want to distribute your application to different customers, you can just tell them, all right, so you know, run this application with this system property on the command line, and then uh, it'll resolve to, to a particular tenant. Um, and there are a few more, like um, a fixed tenant resolver, uh, things like that. You could implement your own uh, tenant resolver. Uh, on the domain class level, um, you have to impl uh, mark your classes to implement the, the multi-tenant uh, interface. And you pass the domain class of, uh, you know, the domain class itself. This is essentially for a generic, generics reason. So, you know, the, uh, the return types of the, of the operations are uh, book. Uh, when you do this, your domain class will get a tenant ID property, right? So I'll show that later. Uh, to do queries, well, you can use the add current tenant, and then it'll use your tenant resolver class to, to resolve which tenant is uh, uh, executing. Uh, or you can use with current at the code level, so like doing this manually, or with ID if you want to resolve to a particular tenant. 
Let's see this in action. So this demo is actually with Micronaut. And um, there's, a, there's a difference with Grails, because in Grails, uh, to resolve a tenant, for instance, uh, per subdomain, is really easy because there's a thread per request. So uh, there's, a, there's actually built-in implementation. Uh, but I wanted to do this in Micronaut, so we had to do um, so um, um, supporting classes in the Micronaut core because uh, it's much more complex because there's multiple threads uh, and then you know where the request is handled, which is the event loop, isn't necessarily well. It won't be the same thread where your code will actually execute. So there is a complexity on uh, you know passing the context from one place to another. But uh, there will be like a better support uh, in the future. So uh, Graham did, did this yesterday. Um, that's for the demo. So uh, we will package and document it and put it in a, in a better shape uh, for the future. Uh, so those classes you see here at the bottom are basically to support this thing in Micronaut. You forget it. Uh, the the tenant resolver implementation, this is the, the method you have to implement. You return a serializable. Uh, you, this is what we will do if you, if you, well, if you want to use a subdomain resolver, then you're done because this will be implemented already. But if you want to do something else, you have to somehow determine, you know, which tenant is running. In here, I'm basing on the request. And then I calculate the subdomain, and um, uh, and this method resolve tenant IDs gives all the options, all the available tenants, right? I have a, a fixed list of tenants, but you could say you could make a query here and say uh, I don't know company dot list uh, get ID or whatever you know what I mean get name etc. Um, what else? This is the domain class uh, implementing the multi-tenant uh, annotation or interface, sorry. Uh, in my case, I want the tenant ID to be a string, so I have to declare the property uh, explicitly. And um, Then to, to create the data, I'm using the with ID method that I told you. So I'm creating four teams to be on a tenant of uh, La Liga and uh, another four belonging to the Premier League. So let's see this in action. I'm running the application. Of course, and this is because I have this guy running here. Don't worry, don't get panic. Um, oh, come on. I've got a um, couple of uh, hosts or domains defined. Uh, this is pointing to localhost. Aliga.football.com is pointing to localhost. So I set that up in, in etc hosts. 
And if we make a request, I get the four teams that belong to uh, La Liga. If, on the other hand, I make a request with Premier League.football.com, I get the four ones that belong to the Premier League. Right, so that's the, and um, if you want to see the controller, I'm doing a final. The trick is the at current tenant annotation. So you see, I'm not filtering by anything. I'm not, I'm not um, doing anything special. So it's Gorm uh, figuring it out for me, which is really cool. And finally, uh, Alice Gorm. Um, Alice Gorm is a, uh, let's say, sub-project of Gorm, where you can use uh, Alex Java 1 in the Gorm operation. So the idea is basically that uh, any domain class implementing Alex entity, uh, for instance, for MongoDB, you use Alex Mongo entity, uh, all the operations, instead of returning a club or a list of clubs, will return observables from Alex Java 1. So the safe method, method returns an observable of book. Right? That's a reactive type of uh, Alex Java. Uh, this is handy if you want, if you really need to use reactive programming with, with GORM, because in, in that case you're not blocking this thread, which is a securing this, and you can compose different uh, reactive uh, functions to be chained or do something else. Uh, one thing to be aware of when using reactive programming, and especially with uh, Alex Java 1, you have to subscribe because if you don't, there's no operation being run. Right? So the uh, Alex Java 1 and uh, reactive streams which came later, um, they work with the observer, the observer uh, pattern. Uh, but they, they require you to subscribe. They require at least one of the observers to subscribe to the operation because uh, otherwise, you know, they won't execute it. So this subscribe um, method takes a closure and the closure will be executed when the result is coming back, right? What happens here is uh, the thread that is running this, this line here, these lines here, will, you know, will run immediately uh, because uh, is you know the request is not blocking on that thread; it's blocking a different thread. So when you call save, uh, you'll get the observable. When you call subscribe, the observable will be running a different thread pool. And when you get the response, this closure will be run in that different thread. That's the way it works. So I've got more examples here, just for your amusement. This is the interface you have to implement, and uh, it'll make the GORM operations to return observables. Um, so reactive programming is great if you need it, because, uh, or if you're going to make any use of it, because uh, you're not blocking. But on the other hand, it'll make your lives uh, miserable. Uh, why? Because you, you have to be very careful. The, you know, the, the programming way is much more complicated. Uh, so, I mean, this, the, this is not for free. So, uh, you have to educate yourself into reactive programming uh, because uh, this is not even like if you remember from Grails the Promise API. The Promise API from, Gra from Grails is, uh, is um, very easy. So, it's like uh, new promise, and then you call then, uh, and you have the results, that's all. In, in reactive programming, there's a, a gazillions of uh, reactive types and uh, operators and things like that. So for instance, 
when you want to do multiple operations. And each of the operations are written observables. And you know, if I, if I were to run this, and uh, well, as I told you, you have to su subscribe anyway. But if I were to run this, uh, I wouldn't know where or when actually all the operations have completed, right? So uh, a way. So what I'm doing here is the observables of saving a book or a club story in this case are not the ones. Uh, what I am subscribing to. I'm not subscribing to O1 or O2. I'm subscribing to a SIP of both operations, right? So this is one of the uh, Alex Java 1 operators. And uh, to, to wrap it up simply, uh, this will be called when all the observables you're passing here are completed, okay? That's the way it works. And then, uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm sipping both safe operations uh, and, and I'm, I'm passing a sip function, which is a, a closure in this case. So I'm returning a list of books, which I get on the subscribe. You see what I mean? And um, there's one good thing about this, if anything, and is that the, there's um, scaffolding for controllers and views. So that's five minutes, okay. So, uh, well, this is one starting point. So this is one uh, scaffolding uh, reactive uh, controller um, when using reactive GORM. So you can see your controller is implementing RS controller. Uh, this is because in your actions on the controllers, you're not returning uh, domain class instances. You're returning observables. So this, this uh, zip guy here is the same we, we, we saw before. And you don't see any subscribe because that's what Grails will do for you. So Grails will subscribe to the observables you return from your actions. And uh, uh, we'll run them in a different thread pool, so you can block there, etc. right? Like, for instance, this get operation is not returning a clap. It's returning a, an observable of a clap. And it's the same with, any, with, um, with all of this. So if you, ha if you have um, potentially long time blocking operations and you have a, a heavy load, there is a potential, you have a chance for this to be beneficial to you in that situation. But I would say not everybody needs reactive programming. And uh, of course, don't use it if you're not uh, taking the time to learn reactive programming. It's my advice. Right? You shouldn't use anything any technology if you're not taking the time to learn it, right? So I think this, this applies to, to everything you do. So is there any question or questions? There's one there. So the question is uh, whether the um, database migration plugin supports uh, migrations over multiple databases. And uh, I think the answer is no. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm 90% sure. <laughs> because, um, you know, this, you know, the, the multi-tenancy is not even part of Grails, it's part of uh, GORM in this case, right? So. I don't think the plugin is aware of that, but uh, it's worth to check. But my, my guess is that uh, it doesn't support it. Uh, uh, yes. 
I, I don't get the question. So, uh, you mean when using uh, multiple data sources? Um, okay, let me. I don't have it here, but uh, I can open it. You mean this? Yeah. Uh, you, you need this on a unit test level or in an standalone context. You, you need to do this because otherwise. There's no Gorm. Uh, ah, yes, it's uh, it's depending on the environment. So uh, it'll go to the test to the you know environment test data source. You of course for the test environment, yeah, or. You could say um, you can pass a, conf a configuration map. So you could say um, map configuration equals something, and then you say data source URL equals uh, JDBC, blah, blah, blah. And then you pass this configuration. as an argument to your hibernate data store definition. <coughs> Any other question? No? Okay, thank you very much for your time and enjoy the last day of the conference. <laughs>